you're watching this, I think it's safe to say that you and I share a couple things in common. Uh, one of them is going to be an interest in woodworking, especially with hand tools, and the other one is going to be chair making. This is going to be a two-part series on making chairs, and I use Windsor techniques, which generally means that there's a solid seat that everything sockets into. But beyond that limitation, I think you'll find there's a lot of different ways to make chairs using whatever materials you have, whatever skills you have, and whatever interests you might have. It seems to be a technology that I can push and pull all sorts of different ways. I can make more contemporary things, or I can make more traditional things and be very satisfying doing either. I can also use dried wood from the lumber yard, like this that was sawn, or I could use wood that I'm going to split from a log. In the first part of the series, I'm going to cover what you can do without using green wood, although I am going to cover green wood because I think what we do with the green wood is relevant even when you're not using it. In the second part of the series, we're going to make this more traditional piece and we are going to use some green wood, but I'm also going to cover techniques that you can use if you don't have green wood accessible to you. That seems to be one of the big limiting factors. And my goal in this video is to remove whatever is limiting you from making your chairs because really this technology is as simple as drilling a hole and whittling a peg to fit in it and knocking it home. I mean, that sounds like a gross simplification, but I think once you get into it, you'll realize that a lot of the other stuff is just window dressing on what is a very simple process. Like a lot of simple processes, though, it's going to involve some new tools to you and some new techniques. And I'm going to try and show you an array of ways of doing things so that it can suit whatever you have interest in and at hand. And I think you're going to find it's actually very flexible. You can get away with very little, and you can also spend a lifetime, I think, deepening your understanding of these techniques. The project we're going to focus on in this first video is making this perch here. And the perch is basically uh, a seat that has sort of a forward uh, stance to it so that you can sit on it and keep your back more easily upright. We're going to talk a little bit more about the ergonomics in a minute, but first I want to talk about the materials and the technology involved. I really love this piece because it's relatively fast to make, and you can do the entire thing out of one species of kiln-dried wood if you want, like I did with this. This is actually air-dried, but if, uh, you could do with this walnut. Or I mix species, like I do in this one, which is in process with a butternut seat and some white oak legs. It really allows you to play with the materials just a little bit more, as long as they meet the strength requirements and the ease of carving requirements. I think you're going to find yourself pretty satisfied. So whatever you have at hand is probably going to work out well. I think uh, maple works great for these legs. As well as ash. You could do the seat out of poplar. You could do it out of uh, basswood. You can do whatever you want as far as that goes. You're not carving this all too deeply, so I don't think you're going to find yourself really struggling regardless of the material choice. I'd probably stay away from hardwoods uh, that are super dense like an oak. In this case, because I had oak legs but I wanted it to match the seat, I decided to go with butternut, which plays really nicely with the white oak. As far as the technology goes, you can see we're going to get a chance to do some really fun carving on this. Um, the general uh, undercarriage here is pretty simple. It's a simple T. Uh, the sight lines for that are really simple as well. I like this as an introductory project because I think you're going to be able to find your way to it with uh, really simple tools and just a great focus on what these new techniques are and how to do them well so that later when we get into more complicated projects, you have that in hand and it's not so shocking to you to try and take it all on at once. I think this is a great introductory project and I think you're going to find it very useful around the house as well. I don't think it's a controversial statement to say that sitting has a pretty bad rap and I think there's some pretty good reasons for that. We are definitely built to stand up. We've got our spine and a bunch of musculature in front of it and our leg muscles and the tilt of our pelvis. All these things are designed to work really well when we're standing and moving around. Obviously, we're, we're bipedal. Um, but we do sit, and we sit for a lot of reasons. Some is to give us rest, some is to work, and each chair has to be sort of uh, attuned and designed thinking about what the use is going to be. I want to point out, when you do sit in general on a standard chair, what some of the problems are so you can see how hopefully some of these other thoughts on sitting help address them. So if I come here and I come down into the chair like this, my knees have now gone uh, close to the level of my pelvis. And that creates a problem. My hamstrings, the back of my legs here, are really pulling and they're trying to roll my pelvis back. Okay? To make it even worse, this chair is ever so slightly tilted back. And I'll go into that in a minute. But as that happens, my, what's going to happen is I'm going to slump over. It's just, it's just a natural position to take. You have to work pretty hard and have a pretty good amount of flexibility if you want to stay forward like this in a chair like this. 
Okay, it's, it's going to be tiring after a while, and really everything seems to be pulling me back in this direction. And one of the reasons for that in a chair like this with a back is that basically I'm taking a system that works with me standing of the alignment of my spine and my pelvis and my legs, and I'm collapsing it. I'm really breaking it of what makes it work. But if I sit like this, by having that slight tilt on this chair, as I collapse, the chair is there, of course, to, to greet me and to meet me and to help keep me in what is a decent position. It's not going to allow my spine to take any really terrible uh, shapes, you know, and in convex shapes like this that are really destructive to the way your spine is built to be. And that, this is why a chair like this works. You'll see I do things like this, like I might put my hands down here. A lot of times in chairs that don't have a little backward slant here, you're going to see the person sort of sliding forward and out of it. So a slight backward tilt is a good thing. Um, if they do slide out of it, a lot of times what you're going to see when people take this position is that they're going to cross their legs. And they're doing something very specific when they do that. You'll notice that now I've got a foot grounded on the ground and a foot grounded on my knee. I've got this here. And what I've created is sort of a stable base for my pelvis mostly because my pelvis in this position is not in a good place. Basically, when you're standing, your pelvis is there as a base for your spine, and it connects to everything in all these ways, but one way it is not intended to be is that all the pressure goes right to it. So all that pressure is pushing my pelvis around quite a bit and causing me some strain. This helps lock in that pelvic position and creates a little bit more stability from here up, and that's one of the reasons I, I think people cross their legs a lot is because they're not being given that stability via the chair itself. Hopefully, if the chair is well designed, you can sneak your butt back far enough that you get good support back here in your lower back so that basically that pelvis is sort of locked and stable as it is. And you can stay forward or upright or back pretty comfortably in a position that's going to be good for your spine. So if a chair is working for you successfully, that's great. A lot of times, I'm trying to work or I'm trying to do something else. And this is one of my favorite working chairs. And the difference between this and the other chair is it's a little bit taller, which means my knees are lower than my pelvis. That means there's less strain on my lower back, less uh, pressure for my pelvis to rotate. And so I can stay upright on this one much more easily, even though it does tilt back ever so slightly because my knees are lower. So I can work in this chair a lot. And if I need a rest for my core and I just want to relax, I can come back and I can do this, and that's a very comfortable way for me to be. It has a lot of flex to it, and so I can sit like this for quite a while, come here. I can even move one of my knees uh, lower, or both of them, if I come to the edge of the chair, and now I'm upright much more comfortably for typing or drawing or something where I'm working. That's great. That's one of the things I love this little chair for. It's just very comfortable. You can even uh, sit sideways in it. There's just lots of reasons this has become a real favorite of mine. And now I want to point out what the perch does for me. <clears throat> now the perch is tall too, and that has a couple of nice things about it. One is I don't have to go down as low as into a regular chair, which means it takes very much less effort for me to get out of the chair. And that's a big deal to me. If I'm working and I'm moving around in my environment a lot, I want to be able to plunk down, do something, and get up without feeling like I'm doing the, 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 the groaning, standing up from a chair feeling. The other thing it does is it puts my knees much lower than my pelvis, which I like a lot. Not so low that I feel a lot of pressure on my thighs here, but it's definitely lower in a way that makes it really much more natural position for my pelvis, much more like I'm just standing here. Now, when you look at this piece, a lot of folks, including myself in the beginning, thought that just the forward slant is what's really happening here, and that's what's doing it. But in fact, the part where you're sitting is actually pretty neutral. So this part is neutral here, meaning it's only maybe about two or three degrees tilted forward. But really, it's about the fact that this portion here, where your thighs go, slopes much more forward than that. So it really gives a, a path for your thighs to, to follow down when your knees are that low. And then the back here comes up just a little bit. And that's going to help roll my pelvis forward as well if I need that extra support. And so what I find is when I sit on this, it really does just trace where my body wants to be in this position. So I've got a little pressure that's very even all around on uh, my underside of my thighs and on the back of my butt here. And then I can just sit pretty naturally. I do think it's important that this, this area here be just deeply carved enough to hold you just a little bit. You don't want to feel like you're sliding out of this. But a lot of what keeps you from sliding is the fact that you've got your knees planted here. So basically, I'm forming a, a bit of a tripod. I've got my feet here 
and I've got this here. So I've got one, two, three contact points, and that is what I'm using to stabilize my pelvis. So by having this long leg working for me to, to help stabilize my pelvis, it works out great. Uh, a lot of you might remember the kneeling chairs uh, from the 80s, especially the early computer chairs. Those sort of did something like this, but the problem with them is they cut off all the levers I get from my feet and put it from my knees up. And your knees, just like your pelvis, aren't really meant for that kind of pressure. Your feet, however, they're built for it. So the fact that I have all this feedback from my feet when I'm trying to sit here comfortably really helps me out a lot. So while I'm working, I'm moving a lot, and the key to making just about any chair successful is the ability to move. It should never force you into position. It can suggest and support positions, but in general, you need to be able to move from one position to another if you're gonna maintain comfort for any extended period. So what I find myself doing a lot when I'm in this is I'll put one leg back or even two legs back, and you can see when I do that, I get a lot more pressure on my thighs for a little bit, but it really pulls my butt right out of the seat, and then I'm just sitting more, more like in the standing position from my pelvis up, just much more comfortably that way. And when that gets a little tiring, you know, I put my feet down here, I can scooch myself back, and again, I'm back in a more stable position with my feet on the ground. So hopefully you can see how this can become a pretty useful piece of furniture for you, but also it gives you a cue into the fact that when we are asking people to sit, we're basically taking a system that works perfectly and breaking it. So we have to really think a lot about what we're offering in return, and hopefully you know, this notion that you would just capture the body in a perfect position uh, leaves you and you can think a little bit more about how a chair becomes almost like a, a piece of exercise equipment or something that you can work with to make it so that you can do the tasks you want to do while sitting for an extended period. Really at the heart of all woodworking lies the meeting between wood and steel. So I think it's worth taking a bit of a deep dive into each of these different components of the craft because where they meet is where everything happens. And I think a slightly deeper understanding and thought process about each one is gonna help you bring them together to do the things you're trying to do. So what you see in front of me here is a bunch of different configurations of uh, steel tools. And I've got chisels and planes and draw knives and all that. And it's all the same thing, just simply configured differently to cut the wood a little bit differently. But it's all made up of high carbon steel. And I wanna just take a minute to think about high carbon steel and what it is, because I think it helps when you're understanding about sharpening it and using it. So basically I think of it as a bunch of marbles, which are the atoms in a box. And they don't quite fit in the box perfectly, so they can rattle around a little bit in there. When you add the carbon, it's another smaller marble that fits in between all of the iron marbles and locks them in place. All of a sudden, they meet the edge of the box, and it's a rigid structure. Okay, but it's still probably got some pliability to it. So what we do to, to toughen the stuff up is we heat it to cherry hot. And when you heat it to cherry hot, it actually gets everything jiggling and it forms a very tight, strong matrix. Everything snugs up really tight against each other and then we freeze it in that position by quenching it. So you quench it in some sort of a medium like oil or water, depending on what it is, sometimes air. And when you do that, it makes it rock hard all of a sudden, but there's a lot of tension built into it. If you left it in that state, it would start to sort of micro crack and degrade over time because that tension couldn't be sustained. So what we do is we, we heat it up again. You put it back in the forge or you heat it with a torch until it gets to a certain temperature, which you can tell by the color of the steel, or if you have other means, you can uh, use some sort of a thermometer, but basically I like to use the color of the steel to tell me what's going on. Normally a, a light yellow to a straw, to a deep straw color is the range of what I want. Maybe for an ax, it's a little bit higher than that, but I never want it to get blue. Blue is what you're familiar with if you've ever gone to a grinder and overdone it a bit, where you've heated it up so much that it actually softens the edge too much. Because if you've gone to blue, it's now reached a temperature where it won't hold that edge any longer. So I think of that second heating as sort of relaxing the matrix just enough. And you want to relax that matrix just enough for it to perform the task at hand. You also want it to do it enough so that whatever angle you need to use for the specific tool can be sustained. So you're gonna see different angles on all sorts of tools. You know, you're gonna see very low angles with tools that you might just be pushing, ones that you plan on hitting with a uh, mallet or swinging. You're gonna find that those tools need to be a little bit softer because they need to be a little bit more tough than hard. And it's always a give and take between tough and hard when you're talking about these tools. And then how much of an angle you can get out of those tools and still have them perform becomes the question. And I always take my tools, so for instance, if I got a new draw knife, I might take that draw knife 
and lay that bevel back as much as I can because I want as thin of an edge as I could possibly get. So each time I sharpen it, I try and bring it back a little bit more. And at some point, I'll go too far and I'll start to see little chips easily forming out of the edge, very tiny ones. You, they show up as like light streaks on the wood or the edge might even just crumple a little bit. And that just tells me I've taken it too far, but that's okay because then I back off a little bit and I reach that happy medium where it's really, really fine, but it's not so fine that it crumbles or chips. And that's where I try and keep that tool for the rest of its life, depending on what wood I'm using. It might be different if it's a uh, wood I'm, uh, tool I'm gonna be using on pine versus like a hardwood. That can always change and maybe I'll have to change the angle on it. So I don't believe in any like set notions. You can say, yes, 27 and a half degrees is a great angle. And it, it is for a lot of things, for a lot of steels, for a lot of tasks in a certain chisel. But really what I look at is what can my tool handle? These uh, spoke shaves by Caleb James do a great job with a very low angle. They're very hard. What he's done with the way he hardens it is fantastic. And because I'm never hitting this with a mallet or doing anything violent to it, I'm always using it as a very fine finish tool. It can sustain that kind of an edge. Another thing I want to talk about with these steel tools is what happens when you skew and slice with them. Because really what you're doing when you do those two things is you're affecting the angle of the edge as well as whatever angle it was initially sharpened to. So for instance, if I travel straight up the back of this tool, I'm really using the angle that this is ground to. But every bit that I diverge from that, every bit that I go up the side angle here, even more so by skewing it, or slicing down the way, that effectively lowers that angle. So that actually makes this blade that was ground to, sharp, to be sharp like this act like a blade that's like this. So I'm kind of getting what I wanted in the beginning, which is a thinner edge. And another way of uh, making this more viscerally obvious is, is to put my finger on here. Now this is reasonably sharp. And I can press really hard and it's not gonna cut me because at the angle it's actually ground to, it can't do that. I mean, it probably could if I really pushed it super hard. But boy, if I slide that finger at all, it's gonna cut right into me, just like a tomato. And the reason that's gonna happen is because I, at that point, because I'm just going sideways across there, have lowered that cutting angle so terribly much, there's just no stopping it from cutting. And I use that all the time. Every tool that I pick up, I think, can, how can I skew and slice this tool to get the most out of it? Because hand tools don't work just because you're physically powerful. They work because you know how to use them. So now let's talk about the wood a little bit. Uh, wood basically is a fibrous material. I think we understand that. It's pretty obvious when you see it like this in the, in the green form, this piece of red oak. A lot of times in chair making, strength is our, our issue as well as workability. And getting all those fibers in line, that is the name of the game. And you can see how easily uh, representative this piece is from what comes out of here. So you can imagine I would just keep splitting this piece smaller and smaller and smaller, and then I would shave it with my draw knife, which is really just a refined splitting tool, until what I'm left with has all those fibers intact and I get a lot of flexibility and strength. In chair making, you, you really can't beat that. That is the name of the game. That being said, I'm gonna show you how if you understand what you're looking for, you can even take a board and saw pieces out to get a lot of the same results. I do know that there's a lot of parts I can make out of the board that are gonna be plenty strong, like for legs and things like that, because getting the same results that you would get if you'd split it from a log is not that difficult. And I like it because it's accessible and it's actually pretty easy to work in a lot of cases where sometimes, frankly, going out in the middle of winter and splitting a log isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. If you could get those same legs you're making out of a board, I don't see why you wouldn't want to do that or at least know how. So let's talk for just a minute about how wood dries. I think that's pretty important to understanding the difference between these two pieces of oak right here. So this piece of oak, I think of it like a sponge. It's got water in the cells and the cell walls, so it's pretty swollen. It's, it's pretty rigid in that watery state. What happens when you expose it to air like this is it's gonna start to shed some of that water, and first it loses it from inside the cells. Once those cells have lost their water to a certain point, it starts losing it from the cell walls. That is when it's gonna start changing dimensions. So if you think about that sponge on your kitchen sink that you've wrung out, it now only has water in the cell walls and it's the same size as before you wrung it out basically. Once uh, it does start to dry in those cell walls, that's when it starts shrinking. And the same thing happens 
with this material as well. So getting that to happen evenly is kind of the name of the game. Normally with pieces like this, I try and keep them as big a section as I can so they don't lose any of their moisture. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about storage and, and things like that later on. But right now, let's just focus on the fact that if you take this and you air dry it long enough, it is going to become quite dry and rock hard. So once it goes down below the fiber saturation point, which is really where it starts losing the water from those cell walls, it can go down to you know 3% in, in, in a dry climate inside your house of, of moisture in it. At that point, it's going to be rock hard and it's going to be tough. And some of the capacity that you had before as far as workability goes out the window. One of the reasons to choose green wood if you can is for that workability because hand tools do great with it. But that shouldn't be your limiting factor because for most of what you're going to do, you can get the same results out of the dried wood. So now I'd like to look at what happens when the steel meets the wood. Basically, my goal is to exploit any weakness in this wood that I can. So thinking about how it holds together is really important. These, these fibers, these long fibers in here, hold together really nicely, especially uh, you can see that when you start to carve them like this, and you start to see how, how continuous and strong those fibers can be when you uh, try and cut straight down the line versus when you cut across like this. So here, what you see is that the, the shaving itself sort of tells you the story that there's just not much connecting these fibers side to side as there is trying to peel them as they go down the line there. And I use that quite a bit. I almost do any cutting that I can across the fibers first. I might do a final cleanup pass along like you might see me doing if I'm hand planing a seat, but everything I do, carving the seat, whatever I'm doing, I'm always trying to get that impact. And if you see me cutting with a draw knife, if I was cutting this whole face with a draw knife, you would see me doing the same thing as best I could by skewing the draw knife like this, because that way the force is actually heading this direction as it cuts, which is getting as much of that cross grain advantage as I can. That is key to me at just about any point. What it does is it gives me about 20 or 30% more strength and stamina and power with these tools. And that's what I want to get when I'm using hand tools. And you can do that better by just understanding what to expect from the wood, depending on what direction you're coming at it. I think showing hewing is a really great way to help understand further what you can do with this material, which is basically I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna fracture those long fibers, okay? I'm gonna sever them at a series of points to a specific depth. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna disable that resistance to splitting that it has into a bunch of small sections that are very easily gonna split off. So watch what this looks like. First, I take a bunch of depth uh, strokes. And once I've done that, now I've got this weak layer right at the bottom of each of those strokes, and I can just sort of split those off really easily. And it goes right to the bottom of that layer. So now you can see that what I've done is I've, I've created a sort of a mix between the two. So I both split and cross cut this piece to get that result. And that's a great way of thinking about how you can break this wood apart. So if I had this piece and I thought to myself, oh, I need to take an inch off of one side, I could split it, I could saw it, or I could hew it. And I think once you start to think about the wood that way and how it's gonna break apart, it can be very helpful to speed up your process, especially with the hand tools. What I've got in front of me here is basically the full chairmaker's tool set that I need to make a chair. Um, I've set out my very first chair here as an example of what you can do without a lot of these tools. What you see here is a lot of duplication of tools, tools that uh, sort of do the same thing that the other one does, only better, or maybe one is a rough tool and the other one's a finished tool. This is basically what I would use now, but when I started out, I didn't have all these. I only had maybe five or six of these tools. A lot of the tasks can be done with a very crude object. And in other words, over here I've got you know, a few tools for seat carving, but truthfully, most of it can be done with a simple gouge. All right, I just wanna point that out to you so that you don't confuse this ever with something that should stand in the way of you being able to build a chair. Uh, a lot of these tools are helpful, but not absolutely necessary. That being said, I'm gonna run you through what it is I've got here so you can see, and then as I approach each task, I'm gonna talk about the tools used in that task, the possible tools, the most necessary tools, and then I'm gonna show you how to tune them up and how to use them properly. So starting over here with seat carving, that's one of the more unusual things we do in chair making, so I think it's a good place to start. You've got an in shave here, and you've got a travisher, a rasp, 
and a gouge. Now, of course, you can do all this work with the gouge if you wanted to, or you could do it all with just about any of these tools. It's just about how much time you're going to take to do it. So on your first chair especially, I wouldn't get too hung up on some of these more specialty tools. Over here, you've got what I would call your shaping and shaving section, which is your draw knife. Very useful for carving, especially on the, the project we're going to do for this video. And a couple of different spoke shaves, wooden and metal. I use wooden and metal interchangeably sometimes, but specifically sometimes I prefer them for different tasks. That being said, of course, when I started out, I think I only had one metal spoke shave. These over here are your basic set of tools that you're probably already going to have in your workshop. I've got a scraper, and I've got a, uh, a saw, and I've got a hand plane. These are just basic woodworking tools that of course come into play here. I especially want to draw your attention to the scraper. The scraper is one of those tools that can replace a lot of these different things because you can really do a lot of shaping and surfacing with that tool, especially when it's properly sharpened. Back here we have one of our more specialty tools, which is a reamer. This is one of those rare tools that I actually, when I started, I actually made my own and it was pretty crude, but it got the job done and I'm gonna talk about how to use that one. That's a really important tool. That just takes a cylindrical hole and turns it into a tapered one. Now, to make that hole, we're gonna use drill bits and I'm gonna show you how I shape my own drill bits that I find the most useful way for me to do that. And we're gonna talk about other ways of drilling. I've got Forstner bits, we'll even talk about auger bits and things like that. There's lots of ways to make a hole. As long as it makes it uh, to your specs, then it's the right way to do it. Over here, I've got my turning tools. You can see I only have four main turning tools. This is really my, almost my whole kit of turning tools, and that's a great place to start. I've got a way to measure, and also I've got some more specialty tools. This is a great kind of thing if you're just starting out and turning, you're not so, so great at it yet, you can use this to help you make your joinery really top notch before your skills are, are that far along. Over here, you see I've got one lone wedge, and that wedge is really just representing all the green woodworking tools that I've, I show in the green working section of this video. So as you can see, it's not that many tools. Uh, they're not that complicated, but they sure can make a lot of great work. So today we're gonna go on site and out of the shop here and into an environment where I may not have some things I need. So I'm extra careful to look over everything I'm gonna bring with me and make sure I've got everything that I'm gonna need. Uh, that first starts with all the safety equipment and of course the, the, the chainsaw to do the cutting if we're gonna be splitting up a log. So I've got my chainsaw here. Uh, it's important that I've tuned it up and I make sure that it's in good operating condition. Nothing is worse than getting out there and not having that work. It's also important that you keep it sharp, either have it professionally filed or file it yourself. After every few filings, I will definitely take take it in and have somebody put it on a machine and grind it properly for me. That really extends the life of that uh, saw blade. After that, I need to look at my wedges. That's really the main thing is that my wedges and my sledges are gonna get most of the work done here. So I've got a bunch of my wedges out here. So you can see I've got wedges and a lot of these I've taken care to uh, cut off any excess uh, mushrooming that is gonna cause trauma for me around these edges. But then there's some that you can see here that I haven't done that with. So I'm gonna to have to take my angle grinder and fix that one up and I'll show you how I go about doing that. Um, I have a couple of different kind of wedges that I like to use. I've got these long skinny stave wedges and the stave wedges are really great because they really slide in to the log uh, a long ways before pushing it open too much so the split tends to run very nice and straight plus just being less of an angle to put in there, they're easier to push in. Uh, the other ones are just standard ones. I just pick these up whenever I see it at a, at a flea market or a garage sale. I just buy it, you know, hopefully for 10 or 15 bucks and uh, sometimes for as low as two. Who knows if people don't know what they have. So um, as you can see, I've got a few of these. I've probably had about 15 of these over the years. I have like four sitting in front of me. They do tend to get lost in the dirt, especially in the snow if you're working out in the snow. So I do like to paint them. I, you can see many times I've painted these, uh, the summer color being white and the winter color being red and that always wears off. So it's a good idea to keep up on that. But mainly the condition of them, which is the edge, is really critical. You can see here that I've got some problems with some of these edges. They're a little blunted. That's not gonna help me at all. So again, I need to get in there with my angle grinder and take care of that. These are some really nice stave wedges. I'll uh, list where you can get these on my website on the information page about this video. And these are really fantastic. So I, I highly recommend these. I'm also gonna need some hatchets. These hatchets are gonna help me uh, clear any excess webbing just to, just to free the log up. Um, I also use them as a form of stave wedge. So you can see these S-wing hatchets, which I'm a big fan of, have a metal neck on them. And really, if you look at the profile of this, you can see that it has a nice thin 
uh, portion and then it flares out. I find that really handy so I can drive that in as a wedge to get things started. And not only do I do my first scoring with it, but then I can use it as my first wedge. That is super handy. So I, I have a couple of those I'm gonna bring with me. I also am gonna, of course, have some gloves. I like these rubber dipped gloves. These reduce the amount of holding force I have to apply, which is huge when it comes to this. This is where you're gonna help prevent injuries to your, to your elbows and your arms, because when you're gripping something and you're hitting at the same time, if you're gripping really hard, that really strains all of these tendons in your elbows. So I, I'm a huge fan of these. They make me just, uh, in general, stronger, it feels like, so. I'm gonna need some fros and a club. I've got a nice little hardwood uh, mallet here, and I bring a couple of fros with me. Uh, nice profile on this fro. I'll go into this tool later when we get into controlled splitting to tell you what it is about that profile that I really like. And here's another one. This is an older one. It's, it's nice. It's got a nice closed eye on it. A lot of times that weld has come loose, and this one is nice and tight. So I'm a big fan of that right there. Uh, Hearing protection, of course, is, is really important. I mean, I hope I don't have to say that with a chainsaw, but I guess we do. Uh, tape measure, so easy to forget. I've showed up many times without one of those and regretted it. I have some hardwood gluts here. Now these are gonna take the place of the wedges very quickly. Once I get my split started, I like to complete it with this because it can open the split up wider than my small wedges. Plus these are basically disposable, as you can see. Over time, you're gonna work your way through these and then just run them through the wood stove and uh, thank them for a life of service there. A big one to bring with you is some water. Uh, it's an easy one to forget, but this is thirsty work and you wanna stay hydrated while you do it. I'm also gonna bring a saw file, which I've got over here in case I need to touch up my saw at all. And of course, everything I need to run my saw, which is gonna be some bar oil. Uh, definitely wanna make sure I have what I need to tune the saw or to take it apart if I need to. And I also like to use this pre-mixed fuel. The reason I like the pre-mixed fuel is because it's got uh, no ethanol in it. And it's the ethanol that's gonna clog up your, your uh, carburetor on this and your filter and make it so that your saw stops running. I learned that the hard way. If you ever have to store your saw for a long period, you need to get any of the gas that you've taken from like a gas station out of it. Otherwise, it's gonna gum it up pretty hard. This doesn't have that problem. So I spend a little bit more, but it comes pre-mixed, which I like. It saves me a step of something, and it also assures me that I'm not gonna have to go back and complain about why my saw isn't working quite right. Uh, besides that, this is an easy one to forget too. This is a cant hook. This is gonna help me uh, use some leverage to roll the log around. Moving the log is, is really important. Obviously, you have to but it's a huge heavy thing and it's really easy to think that you can just push it or shove it and I'm gonna try and uh, encourage you not to do that because if you're not using leverage, it's, it's just too easy to hurt yourself. Other than that, uh, I have a nice strong box here that I'm gonna put everything into. This thing's been in service a long time. It keeps getting patched up um, and we're gonna put everything in there and, and get on the road here and hope we haven't forgotten anything once we get to the site. I've got this hammerhead now that I'm gonna fit on here. Uh, it needs a little bit of work to make it a little bit more safe, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wedge it onto this new handle that I've shaved, and I'm just gonna put it together. I put two kerfs in there already for my wedges. And I'm gonna drop it in here, and I'm gonna use some inertia to my benefit to really squeeze it up into there. A uh, pretty tight gap at the, bot at the top there, but a really tight gap at the bottom. That's the most important one, is the super tight gap down there. Now I'm gonna drive in two wedges. I think it flares it better. You really want an hourglass shape to this handle going through the head. And so now that I've got that, I'm just gonna drive these down at the same time. There we go. And really flare this out. There we go. So importantly, what you can see is that now it, it goes in wider here than at the, 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 the bottom of the throat here, and at the top it flares out more so. That'll keep that, that really sturdy. That being said, I, I always tend to bring some extra wedges with me onto the, the job site where I'm going remotely so that if I need some, I've got some extra wedging power should I need it. 
So I got my wedge all set up here for me to remove some of this mushrooming. The mushrooming is dangerous. That's just where it's peened over through being uh, repeatedly hit with a sledgehammer. That's going to happen to any wedge you have. And over time, you need to cut those off because if you don't, when you strike it at some point, it is going to come off and it's going to come off pretty uh, violently and, and fly at you or somebody who's around you. So it's important to take those off. So I've got my, my uh, face guard here and my hearing protection and I'm going to cut that off. Now, doing this in the workshop isn't my favorite. I'd prefer to be outside or in a garage, both for the noise and the risks of sparks. So if you're going to do this in the workshop, make sure there's nothing uh, flammable about. Make sure there's nowhere that any spark could fly into a pile of shavings, obviously. All right. Now you can see where I've done one face on this and cut that off. So that's nice and clean now. I like to do a little chamfer towards the top, angle it just a little bit. That'll help keep it mushrooming more slowly over time. And hopefully you can see these are the parts that haven't been done. And once I've cut off all four faces on that, as well as dressed up this edge a little bit with my angle grinder so that it's going to be slightly sharper, it's going to help me get it into the wood a little bit easier, then I'm ready to take it out into the field. So here we are on site at my friend Peter Lamb's house. He has a nice red oak log for me that he took down near his house. Normally any log that's going to be near a house I'm, I'm not that interested in, but he sent me photos of it and it seemed nice and straight. Logs that grow up at the edge of the woods or have been from an area that was logged um, and didn't have much restraining them as far as neighbors in the forest tend to grow a little bit knottier and a little wavier, but this one seemed like it was a reasonable thing to uh, split up and see what we could get. The bottom is going to bell out a little bit, so I'm going to cut that off first. I do like to cut the, uh, split the logs while they're in full length. That way, if there's any surprises in there, I can always do my cross cutting with full knowledge of that. It does make things a little bit tougher, but that area at the bottom is just not worth messing with. So I'm going to, uh, after cutting halfway through, I'm rolling this over so I can finish the cut. And once I get rid of that, I am going to just throw myself at this log and see what I can do about splitting it open. It doesn't look like there's any huge amount of twist to the log, and there isn't a large taper from the butt up to the top. These were all good signs that encouraged me that this might be worth my time. This is slightly bigger than a lot of the logs that I would normally use uh, here in New England because I find that a lot of the logs up here have uh, sort of uh, interiors that don't reflect what you see on the exterior. So you might just find yourself struggling against a log that looks great on the outside, but there's really only a few inches of good material. I'd rather do that with a slightly smaller log than with a slightly larger one because it's, it's uh, just a lot of physical work to get them apart, especially if there is sort of a mess inside. Here I'm scoring a line, and this is only needs to go about a quarter of an inch deeper. So this is just right along where there was already a split along that pith. And this is just to start that split out and encourage it. I'm going to drive in my little S-wing hatchet here. And I don't drive it all the way in. I just want to get the split started and running down that end grain. And once I do have it down, I'm going to drive in my stave wedge and slowly open this up. If you were just to drive that in completely, um, but you might find that the split goes from the stave wedge sideways following sort of the, the path of least resistance to the edge of the log. And that's not at all what you want. You want it to follow that score marked line. So once I can, I try and get some wedges in along that line all the way down the uh, line there. And you'll see these are going in pretty nicely. The first split on a log is always the toughest. I always give myself basically a, a couple of hours at least figuring that that with a tough log might be exactly what it takes. You know, the last thing you want to do is get frustrated and start moving too quickly and injure yourself. And so taking this apart is going to be a little bit of an ordeal. It does turn out when I got to the end of it that this one had a little bit more of a twist than I thought, which makes splitting it much more difficult. So I did get that open at the end there, and now I took away some of the bark, and I can see where that split is running down the side. So now I'm going to start taking the wedges and just driving them in as I go. 
and they'll start falling out the end and then I will just leapfrog them down, bringing that split all the way from one end of this log to the other. And I do that on one side generally and then I roll it over and I open up the other side. I find that the best way to go about this. I don't try and split the entire log open like a book from one side. I find it easier to go in from both sides. It just reveals where a lot of that webbing is. And this for a red oak, this behaved much more like a white oak. This is a pretty misbehaved log as far as splitting goes. This really took some, some real force to take care of. And so now you'll just see it's important to, to get a good rhythm so you don't uh, exhaust yourself. And I don't drive these wedges in all the way. I like to leave them about an inch out. That way, if I need to, I can tap them on the side and bring them up. I'm sure you'll see me doing that here in a, in a minute or two. And so now it's just a long run down the way. There it is. And that comes, that brings them right out. And then I just keep going. Now, when I place this at the end of that split, I don't go to the very end of where I can see that there is a split. I go to the last place that I can see that there's a a pretty good chasm happening so that the wedge doesn't create a whole new split in there. I want to just open up the one that's already there. I don't want to start a series of new ones. That's, that's a really important detail there. As I keep going down here soon, I'm going to have it open enough that I think it's time to go in with the uh, wooden glut. And you'll see that that really, really creates a lot of pressure in there and really starts cracking this thing open. You'll start to see that happening here. As you can see, while it traces down that line, there is a bit of a twist to this. That, that split just on its own is sort of going at a bit of an angle around the log, but it's not enough to make it either too difficult or not worth using. Most of my parts end up round anyway, so a slight twist isn't going to be an issue. Once I got it all the way down the line, I'm going to use those gluts just to really open it up and come back in and try and cut out what we call webbing. So this is the webbing that you're going to find in just about any log. Some are worse than others. This is surprisingly bad for a red oak log. This is more like how a white oak looks if you, if you look what I do in here. There is quite a bit of that going on and it is surprising the tensile strength of those little webs. They, they will really hold this thing taut. See, I'm using two gluts together to open it up as much as I possibly can. And even so, it's not going to open like a book, so I'm going to need to roll this thing over and come in from the other side for sure. I use my cant hook to get some leverage on it. It's physically challenging, so again, be real careful. And now this should go a little bit easier. Of course, uh, speeding it up doesn't hurt. There it is. So now it's opening up, but you see it's not falling apart. And that is not surprising at all, given how much uh, the twist and the webbing has uh, made this difficult. So I'm just going to keep knocking at it. And then it is soon going to break open for me. The Go Devil does a great job just uh, slamming it. Sometimes a, a little violence goes a long way when you're trying to open up a log. And soon it'll just Every other split after that first split is going to be much easier. Uh, that circular tension in the first split of a log is not to be underestimated. It really holds on. It really fights you every bit of the way. But now it, it really uh, doesn't do that. There just isn't that same sort of resistance. So I'm going to come in again with my S-wing. Whenever you're splitting something that's this large where you can't actually physically manipulate the two sides to make uh, the split run one way or the other, there is no place for anything but wedges. You just do everything in half. I always think of it sort of like a pizza. You just cut it into four, and then you cut it into eight, and then 16, whatever you can do, until you can get down to the point where you could actually physically pull and push on the wood enough to affect where that split will run, wedges are the way to go in keeping things in halves. If you do get off of doing things in halves, you're going to find yourself really struggling because two, two parts will, uh, if they're uneven, one will always become a form of a spring. So you'll be, you'll be pulling uh, on one side, and the other side will just be staying straight, and it will just act like a spring. So you don't want to get into that situation. And I'm 
almost done running down the line here. All it's going to take is a couple of wooden gluts and a bunch of webbing cutting. We'll be through this. I'm going to cut one of these pieces in half so that we can throw it in the back of my truck and take it away. One of my favorite things to do once I've cut down a log is to take a look at it and, and look at basically its history and its makeup to understand a little bit more about what I've got. Um, as I mentioned in the video, I like to split things full length so that I can you know, not have any grand surprises if I cross cut it in the wrong location. But I also learn a lot by looking at the end grain of the log as well. So let's just take a minute and look at this log and we can understand a little bit about uh, how it grew and how it might be useful to us. So you can see here that in the very beginning of this log's life, it was growing pretty rapidly. These growth rings in the beginning were, were pretty big. That meant every year it was getting lots of nutrients, lots of light, lots of water, and it was growing rapidly. Then it started to slow down, and that's pretty common. What happens is that the trees start to grow up en masse. So if they all start out and there's not much in an area that was cleared, they all get you know pretty abundant resources. Then slowly as they all get bigger, things get a little bit more scarce. So every year it started to grow a little bit less each time. So what you see and what I'm seeing when I see that is that the small porous rings that show up here as sort of a light ring, those are the same width every year. That just comes on in the spring and it's basically like a bunch of straws is how I think about it. It's the weaker in the ring porous hardwoods of the fibers and it comes on to the same thickness regardless of what kind of year it's going to be. Then after that you see that in the better years you get a thick band of the dense wood and in the more lean years you get a very thin band. So here you've got uh, about 3 16ths to a quarter of an inch as the thicker band and in this region it gets down to some places about a 32nd of an inch so those years this tree barely grew it basically stayed the same size and then as you see, those years kept lean, and then all of a sudden something happened. Either somebody logged the area, or this tree became dominant and uh, reached the canopy and out, out uh, covered the other trees that were around it. And then all of a sudden, it started growing more and more. I'd, I'd probably say that it was because of a logging, because then it just keeps dominant for the rest of its life, basically. You can also see a little bit about what is uneven in the tree, maybe where there's an inclusion or something. So if, if an inclusion happens at some point in the tree, the rest of the growth rings around it are going to be deformed. And that's going to cause reaction wood, the kind of wood I don't want in my chair. Basically, I'm looking for the most distinctly perfect wood I can get out of this tree. That's why we cut the butt end off of the log. And that's why I'm always looking to avoid any branches or knots that I find in the middle of the tree. One thing you can also think about when you're looking at this is these areas that were slower growth versus the areas that were more rapid growth have a difference in their density. So if you look out here in the area that has the more rapid growth, that's the area where you're going to have more proportionally dense rings to porous rings. Where if you look into this area here, it's going to be about even almost in some areas where the dense and the porous are about the same. So if I'm looking for a one by one inch square of material, this square here is going to have much more of the porous rings in relation to the dense rings than say this area out here. So here it might be 50-50, here it might be you know, 80-20. So this is actually going to be a stronger piece of wood. And the interesting thing about this is I think in woodworking a lot, we talk about old growth or slow growth as being a benefit. That may be the case in soft woods where the uh, dense wood is in the early wood rather than the late wood. So the better years are softer than the, the lean years. In this case, we definitely prefer the faster growth. I know it kind of goes against the notion also of how pretty wood can be. So if I talk about slow growth, generally, it makes a very beautiful board when you saw it. You get a lot of what we call cathedrals or a lot of figure in the grain. It looks fantastic. Where a fast growth tree might have one or two rings and look kind of boring. Well, for chairs, I want the most boring wood I can get. So I'm really looking at this, this uh, faster growth wood here as the, the most beneficial wood. 
Another thing to look at at the end grain of this tree is the difference between the sapwood and the heartwood. Now the sapwood is the part of the tree that is alive when the tree is standing. The heartwood is the dead part. The way I always think of this is like it's a murder mystery basically. In the case of this you've got a living portion and you've got a dead portion. This dead portion has already been embalmed. Nature is taking care of that. It has injected these previously living growth rings uh, with a, sort of a chemical cocktail that's gonna help preserve it because this is the structure of the tree. This is the part of the tree that keeps the tree standing. This is why often when you see a tree that's alive and very, very old, this part will be rotted out. It becomes a hollow tree because it's not alive. It has no immune system where this outer portion does. That's why you have that outer ring of living uh, tissue left. Well, in this case, what we have is a murder. And this tree has been cut down in the prime of its life, effectively. And you've got this living portion that didn't have a chance to become embalmed. So it's very susceptible to rot, just like a corpse laying on the, on the uh, forest floor. I know it's getting kind of gruesome, but that's how I think about it. That keeps things straight in my head. Where in this portion has been embalmed. So if this is summertime, I'm going to look to this portion to be the better wood because after just a few weeks, this sap wood is going to be rotten. You can sort of smell when it goes a little bit off. Sometimes you see a little discoloration. It's not worth putting in my chairs is, is the moral of that story. I just don't want to have to deal with that material because it might break on me. Uh, a lot of times in winter, I'll absolutely happily use it because the cold Cold, as it is now, it's, it's late November. The cold is going to preserve this just like it would a body. So hopefully that's not too gross of a way of thinking about this for you to consider the difference between the heartwood and the sapwood. The heartwood is a little bit stronger. It is my preferred wood. But if I get something like this where I know it was just taken down and hasn't seen a lot of warm weather, the sapwood is perfectly usable. The great thing is, is the, the area in the sapwood is probably the best wood on the tree because it's the furthest from this early part of the tree, which I think of as the reckless youth back when the tree was growing a little bit wavy trying to get up to the canopy, but it was really quite skinny still. So it had trouble keeping itself upright. So you probably get a little bit more wave and a little bit more reaction wood in there. Another thing you can learn by looking at the end grain is about reaction wood. So what I look for is a centered pith. It's kind of hard to see on this because I've taken it out of the context of the whole stump. But basically the idea is if the pith is off center, that means that the piece probably grew on a hill or something so that there's a lot of reaction wood in it. In other words, one side of the tree is trying to hold it to the other one to keep it upright when it was coming out of the earth at an angle. That's going to cause a lot of trouble later because when you split that tree open, a lot of the wood that's been forced into one position its entire life is going to be released. And when it's released, that's when you're going to have a lot of unintended warping and bending and bowing. So that's just something to think about. One of the reasons I want to talk about green wood in this first video is because all of these things can be looked to in a sawn board just as well as they can be looked to in the log. It's really important to think about the sawn wood you're going to use and consider how you might use it in such a way to get the utmost strength out of it and what looking at the end grain or even the face of it can tell you about that piece of wood. Now, when I'm talking about the dry wood right now, I'm not talking about the seat so much because the seat in any um, chair I'm going to make is already going to be of dry wood and the strength is generally not an issue. That's taken care of in the choice of the material. But I am going to use a piece of pine here to help point out what I'm looking for when I'm talking about a really good piece of wood for making things like legs or stretchers in a chair. So this piece of pine, you can see there's almost no growth ring showing on the surface as far as cathedrals go. There's nowhere where it actually cuts across and hoops except for one or two spots. That's a good sign for me when I'm looking for a piece of wood. If I turn it to the side here, you can see that the growth rings run all the way down the piece. Now there can be some deceptive uh, things that you can see in a piece of wood that can make this a little bit more confusing. Maybe the tree was twisted and it was sawn and that can throw some of this out a little bit. But just in general, you can, you can learn to start to look at a piece of wood and consider how straight that fiber is going to be in there. So this one looks pretty good. I'm going to show you this piece of oak now that is very different in that regard. You see a lot of different growth rings coming down and cutting across here and certainly when you come here, you can see that those growth rings are running this way. So clearly, if I want to saw this piece of wood, I'm going to end up with a lot of short grain in it. Depending on the size I'm going for and the species I'm using, that could or could not be a problem. But my goal is generally to include as many of those long fibers as I can. Here's a good example of what you might end up with if it's not working to your benefit, 
which now granted this is a piece of elm which is pretty strong but you can see how the growth rings are swooping outward here which means you're going to have a lot of short grain here if that was the bottom of my leg i might have a very weak position here where i could have a shearing problem with that leg so i want to avoid that one of the ways that i avoid that is by splitting the wood here is an example of a piece of maple that I bought as a board, and I examined it to see how the you know, growth rings looked on the surface and how the lines might look on the side. And then I brought it home and I split it. I literally took my fro here and the maul and I split it down the middle. And to me, this was the best of possible results because it basically split parallel to the sawn edge. That is not always gonna be the case. A lot of times it's not going to go parallel to the sawn edge. And then from then on, I would use the new split edge as my reference. So I'm gonna go ahead and split a board and we're gonna see what happens here. Hopefully it will show us uh, the way these fibers are running. And then we could talk about how you could take a board that isn't perfect and still get the material you're gonna need for things like legs or stretchers. Well, that one split pretty good actually. That split right down the middle that way. But here's still the problem we were facing before and we're still facing it. So here you can see the growth rings are running so that the real best part goes from one corner here down to that corner there. So if I was to split this down the middle this way, we're gonna see a very different result in the way it runs. And you can see what I mean. It's starting to follow the fibers and follow those growth rings and it's running out this way. So I'm gonna finish out that split. And now you can see that on one of these faces, the growth rings are following perfectly along there. So now if I come back and I split the other side here, and you can do this by sawing it as well. You don't have to split it to get this result. You can see that when I take this here, putting it halfway across there, because that's gonna give me the most uh, uh, direct way of splitting it and know that the forces are actually following the fibers and not just because I'm splitting off a small section. So I'm gonna come in here and split this. Let's put it back in here. So now what you're seeing in this wood is that I have a perfectly straight piece of wood now as far as following the fibers, most importantly. So what happened was this tree had some curvature or it had some swelling and when they saw it, they didn't pay much attention to that fiber line. But now what I've isolated in here is a piece of wood that is every bit as straight grained as anything I could ever pull out of a log. So hopefully you can start to think about when you're looking at your selection of your logs or your boards now, how you might get that same result. So now, if I did want to make stretchers out of this, for instance, I could come in and treat this just like it was a split piece of wood. And know that I can get these fully strong pieces of wood out of it. And I can do so either by splitting it if I wanted to, or by sawing it. And hopefully that gives you the idea about how any of these materials, be they straight from a log or straight from the lumber yard, can still be useful for chairs. One more concept I want to highlight when we're talking about using boards and green wood and getting the same benefits from either is about grain direction and tool use. Because what happens with a normal piece of wood like, uh, like this one, where I've drawn where the uh, growth rings go on this, you can see there's a very distinct difference between the fiber line and the surfaces of the board. In this instance, as you may have become familiar, if we were like using a hand plane on this, we would have to go one direction on one face and the other direction on the other face. It isn't interchangeable, and if you go the wrong direction, you're gonna get a lot of tear out because you get a, a splitting action that happens. And one of the benefits of splitting wood is that's simply not the case. You can go either direction on any face because you're following the fibers already. The only end grain that's actually exposed on this entire piece is at the actual ends here, where on a piece here, you see end grain exposed 
everywhere that you see a growth ring. So when I'm using tools, be it in turning or in shaving or shaping, it's really handy for me to be able to cut the same direction on any face, knowing that the only rule I have to obey is the thick to thin rule. So as I go around this piece of wood, I can just cut knowing full well that I'm not going to find myself having a splitting action as I go, regardless of which face I'm on. So if this was on the lathe, or if I'm shaving it with a spoke shave, I know exactly what to do. I always go from the thick portion to the thin portion of my shape, and I'm always going to get clean results. That really makes hand tools incredibly effective. And when you're turning on the lathe, it's always going to give you the very best surface quality off of the tools. So I've gathered my materials here for the legs and the seat of this project. And what I want to do basically is get my legs to the point where they're rough turned like this so that all my parts are ready to be dried. Um, either have the whole thing dried like you can do with some of the stretchers or specifically dried like you will with the tenons on the legs. Now if I was doing this from green wood, I would probably rough turn them maybe even a little larger than this. Um, in the beginning because I want to give it a chance to shrink and distort if it's going to. I don't like to do that, uh, go straight from green to the final turnings because if you do that, the distortion is really going to throw off your shapes. And I, I very distinctly like my shapes to be a certain way. So I would let everything air dry myself. We're going to specifically dry the tenons on the legs so that they're super dried. Even with the kiln dried wood, you can still bring it down some in the moisture content. And that way when you assemble it, you will get a differential between the seat and the tenon, and that is going to make it so that you can uh, experience some of that locking we like when the tenon swells back up after drawing the moisture off of that seat. So what I've got here is my legs, and as I showed you before, I had a nice split here on this leg piece, so I'm just going to saw a parallel to that to get my two rear legs. But when I turn it over here, I can look, when I look at the fiber line, I notice that it does not run perfectly parallel to these two surfaces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount it in my lathe in such a way so my center is here and here, and that way I'll be cutting off these portions you see that I've defined with the magic marker. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to make my fat center part perfectly uh, large for what I need, but it's going to redirect these two ends which taper anyway. That's the good news is if you look at any of the legs or any of the parts, they all taper at the end. So by moving this just a little bit in the material, you don't actually lose anything because the center part doesn't move very much even though the ends move quite a bit. That is something I'm going to have to do with just about all of these. So here you see this one followed really nicely as well. This little stretcher, I'm going to have to mount it. And you'll see when I mount it how I go about doing that. Same thing here. Same issue, but here I also, when I split this board, got a very undesirable result, which is that it ran at quite an angle down the board. That's okay though. That just becomes my new reference face, and when I want my stretcher out of it, I simply use that as the reference for measuring. And again, once I cross cut this and mount it in the lathe, you will never know that this piece of wood wasn't split from a log. So I've cut out my seat and one problem that you're probably going to run up against if you're making chairs is that you can end up with a width of board that isn't going to fit through your standard uh, planer. So this one is about 13 inches wide. I have a 12 inch planer so that won't work out. But 
that's okay because for most of my career I never even had the 12 inch planer and everything I did I just flattened by hand. It's really not that hard. Uh, once you get used to it, you can just do it you know, in 10 or 15 minutes. It's not that big a deal. This one's gonna have to come down quite a bit. So for this, I'm pretty happy that I still have my trusty old uh, scrub plane. This thing really makes quick work out of thicknessing as well as taking off a bunch uh, for flattening if you need. This one is not that out of flat already. I can tell that it's not gonna need a ton of flattening. So most of the work is probably gonna be done with this number seven here. But just like you'd imagine, I'm gonna need to make sure that both of these are tuned up pretty nicely. So my first job, because I haven't done this in a little while, is I gotta take these out and I've gotta inspect the blades and make sure I like how sharp they are because that is everything when it comes to making this job go fast and be efficient doing it. So after I took these planes apart, it seemed pretty obvious that uh, both of these blades could use a little bit of love. You can see here, hopefully, that there's a lot of flat on there, a lot more than I would like if I'm honing. The more flat uh, area that you have on there, the harder it's gonna be to be consistent in your honing because of the amount of surface contact you're making. My scrub plane as well, even though it still has some hollow grind left, there's, there's plenty of material there that I don't wanna have to work away with my stones. So I'm gonna grind both of those blades right now. I'm gonna start here with my scrub plane blade and you'll notice it's quite thick. That's partially because it doesn't have a chip breaker and you're gonna do uh, pretty aggressive work with it. This one has a radius, of course, and I reduced the radius it came with. Uh, I don't think you need that much of a radius. As a matter of fact, I think you could put a slight radius on a regular hand plane and just withdraw the chip breaker a bit and get a lot of the same effect. Hopefully it's a, a tool that has a pretty open throat because you're gonna take some pretty thick shavings doing this. I'm using a CBN wheel here, which is really rated more for uh, high speed steel, like super hard metals. But high carbon steel, I haven't found it to load the, the, the tool up at all. It may void your manufacturer warranty, but I found good luck with just my high carbon steel. Maybe it's because modern steels as, as they're made are generally pretty hard. You can see I'm getting a decent grind on it. I like it because you don't have to flatten this wheel and it runs cool. And it also doesn't kick up that aluminum oxide dust that comes off of a standard grinding wheel. I do use standard grinding wheels though, and I, I'd like to uh, true them up so they have a slight radius so I can always control exactly where they're cutting. But in this case, because it's nice and flat, I can actually feel the flatness on the edge of the blade as I'm uh, working it side to side here. And that really gives me a nice consistent result using very, very light pressure here. Like my friend Greg Pennington says, you should uh, have the pressure like you're trying to sharpen a feather. And this is about a 180 grit, which I find removes metal really nicely, but doesn't leave too harsh of a scratch pattern. And in a moment here, I'm gonna show you that I like to put a little magnet underneath my tool rest, and that just helps grab those uh, shavings out of the air exactly as they're made. It really keeps the dust down in the area. Now I've got my stones and I'm gonna start with my 4,000 grit because I've got quite a good hollow grind on these tools and I don't think I'm gonna to need to go much coarser than that. And if I did need to go much coarser than that, I probably would go back to the grinder because that is the fastest way to remove the metal. Now, if I was to push it straight across the stones like this, I don't have much uh, length of bevel that I'm gonna be on. It'd be very easy to accidentally push it on or off the bevel and get pretty poor results. So what I like to do is I slant it a little bit about 45 degree angle and that way now I've got a much longer distance that it's in the in the forward to back range that it's making contact that is much more stable my favorite way to do this is just to pull if I'm really being super careful about this and I'm really concerned about it I'm just gonna pull because I find that it's in that reverse motion sometimes especially if you're new to sharpening it's in that reversal motion that people tend to overcompensate and lift up ever so slightly so if you're new to this what you might probably want to do is just pull on it. And you can see that I've got this finger up front and it is doing almost all the work for me. It's directly over the bevel and it's pushing in. You don't want to make contact with the stone with your finger, but it's pushing down there. And then my, my hand back here, really just the little finger is just picking it up a bit. And I'm just going to keep doing that as I come through here, trying to use the entire stone. That's important. That'll help keep your stone in shape. And then I'm going to see how I'm doing on my results. And the results will both show and you'll feel. You'll feel a little wire is turned all the way across the piece and already I've got that. So in this instance, it's been a while since this has gotten any attention. So I am gonna flatten the back a little bit. And on this, I am gonna go two directions because I've got such great contact with the stone. I'm not too worried about it. And I use this almost like I'm trying to flatten the stone is the idea here.
and you can see that black on the surface, well that's the metal. That's metal coming off my blade. So we know we're sharpening if we see that black. And before I move on, I always like to let it dry out just a little bit on the surface here. In other words, I don't keep using the water because that's gonna just show you fresh grit. And what I want is the grit that's already been broken off of the surface to break down. That gives me what I call slurry. And that slurry is gonna get finer and finer as I go through the sharpening process. So this really gives me sort of an in-between grit before I move on too far. So now I've got that. And I've got the front here. I'm gonna maybe take another pass or two on the front before I move on. Because what I'm trying to do is weaken that point of contact that that little wire edge has with the actual edge. I don't want it to tear off. I want to diminish it until that uh, wire edge just falls off. So now, before I move on uh, to the next stone, while I've got it here, I'm going to go ahead and do my scrub plane. Now with this one, it's a little different because I have to roll it as I go. So while I'm working this, I'm going to have to roll it a little bit. It'd be easier if I was right-handed, but you can see here, I'm going to have to roll it just a hair. So I sort of start on one edge with my finger over here, and I'm going to end by pushing with the other finger so that the contact is there. So this is what that looks like. So that way, I'm making my way across the entire edge, even though it's curved. And again, the pressure right here is all on that finger and this finger up front. Those are doing all the work. I just have a tiny little bit of support at the back here, and I'm keeping it at that 45 degrees. So now I'm going to take a look at it, see how I'm doing. So I'm missing this corner here, very easy to do, but I've got a wire burr that's everywhere else. So I'm gonna switch my positions now, and I am gonna come back this way. Because what I find is that whichever part of the tool is lagging in the back there is the part that's easier to apply pressure. It's tougher to apply pressure on the front portion of any blade. It's easier on this portion. So you'll see what I mean in a moment here. Hopefully that will get that. And indeed, it brought it right over to that corner. So now I've gotten both. That's real important. I also do this with my skews when I'm, when I'm sharpening my skews because they have a little curve too. I just bring it this way and then bring it that way and that tends to take care of the situation. I'm going to add some water here and I'm going to take that burr on the back down a little bit while also flattening the back and getting my stone nice and even. Okay, and again, before I move on, I'll take another couple passes one way and then the other. Okay. And now we're ready to move on. So now I'm going to flip this over and go to my finer stone. This is my 8,000 grit, and I'm going to go through the same process here. So I'll start out on the back here. The reason I like to start out on the back is because it pulls up a little slurry just to begin with. It breaks free some of those particles on the surface. This is a very fine stone, and if I don't do this, I find I get a lot of suction happening uh, when I try and do this bevel. So I don't want that straight off the bat. So I'm going to just start out with that, and now I'll pull it back here and pull this across here. Luckily, we're not sharpening a lot of metal here. We're sharpening just the very edge of that hollow grind, and by doing that and making the hollow grind nice and deep, it doesn't take that much to affect this edge. It really doesn't. You can really polish it up pretty quickly, and hopefully you'll see that here. So you see I've got a nice, nice polish there. I'm going to check the back, go back to the back a little bit, and you see again, I'm letting it dry out on the surface, and by letting it dry out on the surface, I get a nice slurry, and it's that slurry that's going to become my polish, and that's how I'm going to get my, my bright mirror polish on the back here, and then I'll do a little bit more on the front here, and now this blade is ready to get back to work. Now I'll do the same here. I'll throw a little bit more water on there because I do want a little fresh grit exposed. You can see what happens. There it is. That's that fresh grit when you see through the slurry, and now I'm going to go back and do the back of this one. And then, again, just like before, I can push it two ways this way and this way, but you'll notice I'm always trailing away from the edge. I'm not snow plowing into that edge. 
I find that's really easy to dig into your stones, especially if you're new to sharpening. You know, I can see a lot of very experienced sharpeners say you should always go both directions to save your motion, and they're probably right. But if you're new to this, I highly recommend just starting going one direction. The back is probably a little safer, but take it slow because one wrong move, if I was to take this and pick it up just a little bit and drag it across, it's gonna put a little micro bevel on there. And then when I'm sharpening, I'm not actually touching the edge. And if you're not contacting the edge, then you're not actually achieving anything. So get this finished off. So I'm just about ready to start flattening the seat and I wanted to show you this little exercise that I showed folks to, to try and encourage you to think about the way that you use a hand plane because there's really only one way to use it and, and that is uh, to start with the pressure all on the front hand here and then as you go across you need to transfer that pressure to the back hand here so that the tool doesn't dip out on either side. So I choose to use a really small piece of wood here, the end grain of this, and I put a little wax on it to make it run smoother. And then I withdraw the blade and just practice that a few times. And you'll find that it's much more difficult than you might think. And the nice thing about it though, is it really gives you an idea of how distinct that transfer of pressure needs to be. So in the beginning, you really do have all your pressure on this hand in the front. And in the end, all the pressure back here. I think that's really helpful to think about and to get used to because later on, especially when we start flattening uh, edges and jointing them so that we can glue up a board, that's really essential. But it really comes in handy when you're trying to work on a board like this so that you're not just like following the crown that's in a board uh, if it does have one. You're actually creating a flat and then cutting it off. So I'm going to grab this board over here now and I'm going to chuck it right into here. And first I want to look at it and see what I've got. So what I see when I look across my winding sticks is that there is a little bit of a twist to it, but that's not really the issue that most concerns me. Uh, it's that there's a cup here. I don't really even worry on a short piece like this that much about any bowing, which would be this direction. Uh, what I'm looking for is that cup, and, and the cup is up right now, and so what I'm gonna start doing is bringing that cup downward until it's ever so slightly lower than the two sides, because that's really when a plane can perform its best. It's when it's riding over two high spots that you're gonna see a plane really start to flatten. I'm going to start out here with my scrub plane, which is set very lightly. I like to set it light at first so I can get a feel for how the grain direction is going to react to my cuts. And I'm trying to overlap each stroke as I go. And then I'm going to come the other direction. can see is that I'm getting a nice flat on there. It's starting to register and it's starting to register pretty nicely. So now it's really just about expanding that area. So what I'm going to do now is bring this out just a little bit more and get a little more aggressive in how I go about this. flat is getting wider as I go. I'm just going to double check it here real quick and see how I'm doing for my twist. And it's really taking the twist right out of it. 
So each time I come in here, because I start with my hand firmly over the area that I've already flattened and the, 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 the front of the sole is on there too, it ends up just naturally making it a little bit wider of a swath each time that I'm taking my passes. And if I was to exaggerate it, I would have one hand going forward like this and then the other hand comes in and switches off. But you can do that with both hands still on the tool. All right. Now it's flat enough, and I got that crown out of it to the point that I'm going to start using my number seven here. So I'm just trying to get that blade to just peek up from the bottom there. So I can just see it emerging. Okay. A little bit more. Now, as you see, I'm going across the grain all the time, and that's because it's much more difficult to push it with the grain, and when I do that, I'm not taking in as much information, especially if I go straight. So what I'm always trying to do is to push the tool across like this, but at an angle, and that way it's taking in the most information I can get, and then when I switch directions, it takes in a whole new layer of information, and that's why it gets flat. Time to check it again. Let's see what we got here. So it's starting to look pretty good. I can see when I just let the two touch, when I can see that this side touches before that side, that tells me I have a high corner here and here. So to take care of that twist, it's pretty simple. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on this whole area here. I'm just gonna take a series of strokes just from that region. And then I'm going to do the entire board the other direction. Okay, so it's starting to look pretty, but let's see if it's flat. Okay. So it looks like I did a hair more than I needed to actually. And as I look at this, what I want to see is an ever so slight gap in the middle. That means that when I'm cutting, I'm going to find myself at flat pretty quickly here. So what I see here is just a little bit on this side over here is a little bit low. So that means these two corners are now high. So I'm, now that I'm getting flatter, I'm going to bring this blade back in a little bit much. It doesn't need to be quite so deep. And I'm going to go across again with that same technique. And the, the less exposed my blade is, the truly flatter I'm going to be getting it. And then I do the entire board this way. And then just to take in a whole different level of information, I am going to go with the fibers, but I'm not going to go straight like this. I'm going to keep it across like this. Let's see what we got now. It looks really good for twist. I see almost none at all. And as far as flatness goes, no matter what direction I put it in, it's doing a nice job. I'm going to go back at this one last time. I'm going to bring the blade back even more. 
And then this is going to be my reference face for marking my other face. And there it is. So there's face number one. So now that I've got the one face ready to be a reference face, I'm going to take my marking gauge and I'm just going to give myself a fine line that goes all the way around this. And as I go, I like to darken it in so I can see real clearly. You can, you can see I'm going to have to take about a half an inch off this board. But a well sharpened scrub plane makes pretty quick work of that. So one thing I like to do sometimes when I'm doing this is to start out by removing some of that material on the corners with my draw knife. This does two different things when I do this with the draw knife. Not only does it show me exactly where I'm going to be ending my, my planing, but it also prevents a big chunk over here from breaking out potentially right at that edge and uh, dipping down further than I want it to uh, into the area that I mean to be part of my seat. This way I can be very aggressive when the time comes and when you have this much material, that's what you want to do. So now I'm ready to get going again with my scrub plane. I'm going to set it a little bit heavier once I take a few cuts to make sure I'm going a direction that feels good. That feels like I should be going the other direction immediately. I'm going to flip this around. Sometimes if there's a twist in a board, you can expect that different areas might even need different directions. But I'm so far from my finished surface that's half an inch down. I'm not going to worry too much about that. So I'm going to start in here. That seems very reasonable, so I'm even going to go a little bit deeper because I have so much material to remove. This is where a scrub plane really comes in handy. see because my chamfers on the edges are still even that I'm doing an even job of it. And this butternut does not seem to be complaining one bit about the aggression. see I'm getting a little reversal over in this one area. So I'm going to start watching that as I get closer to my final dimension here. I think I got another, eh, maybe another stroke in me before I have to deal with it.
All right, we've gotten rid of a lot of material there. So now I'm gonna bring that blade back just a little bit and have another go at it. there and keep going at it. So now, I think it's just about to the point where I'm going to go back in with my number seven hand plane and start flattening it down. I'll bring out that blade a little bit from where it was in the last one. So right now it's just cutting high spots, so I'm not getting a huge amount of cut. That's going to increase with every pass I make, and soon I'll be taking full passes and getting shavings the entire way. to take a pass right down the line here. Okay, now I'm going to lighten this up and bring myself right down to where my lines are. I can tell that I'm just about to my lines on this side, but back here I still see too much of my chamfer to say that it would be even. So I am going to keep at it, focusing a little bit extra on what happens back here on this end of the board until I get rid of that chamfer. And then I'm just going to carefully watch those lines on the side. Looks like I'm about a 30 second away from my lines on one end and a little bit more on this other.
real work all right so now my board is flat it's 1 11 16 inches thick and it's ready for me to draw the pattern on it <laughs> 